Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Well, we do have a guest speaker. And uh, I'm excited about uh, uh, what he's going to share with you today. I heard his message last night. He was also here, him and his wife, Becky, were here uh, uh uh, to speak to our kids workers in our Mid-Atlantic region because they help, they really lead the kids and the youth uh, ministry for Vineyard USA. And so they travel around. That's their, that's their heart. That's their passion. And they, they really, God has birthed that in them. And they, 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 they uh, have an amazing work there. They also, uh, God called them from, Cal from California years ago to Fort Collins, Colorado, to start a vineyard. It was actually one of the first vineyards that were ever started in this movement. And so they have a lot of wisdom. There's some gray hair, but it's a lot of wisdom, okay? And we get to benefit from that today. Uh, so we're going to invite uh, Rick Olmstead to come up. He's going to share. He's got a terrific word. Let's pray uh, over him that God uh, would use him to, to help us get something, okay? So we'll, we'll, we're praying for us in reverse, right, so that we're, we're able to receive what God's put on his heart. Okay, so Father, we thank you right now, Lord, for Rick, and we just bless him, his word, and, and uh, the preparation that's gone into this, and really the life preparation, some of the things that really you've just been doing his whole life, and, and working grace through him, and, and we are beneficiaries today. Lord, open our hearts to receive, open the eyes of our hearts to see uh, that we can be changed, Lord. Help us, Lord, to uh, see what you have to say to us, that we can be freed and live more faithfully, more, uh, more uh, truthfully uh, with ourselves, with others, and before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Vineyard family. You know, I love saying that when I get to travel because the vineyard is not just a, a group of churches that we are family. And so maybe I'm the family guy they never <laughs> told you about. I think we all have one of those. Maybe I'm that uncle from Colorado that, uh, that you didn't hear about, but, uh, but here I am. So I, I'm excited to be here, and uh, I have been in the vineyard since the very beginning, and I've seen a, a lot of things come and go, and uh, I happen to love who the vineyard is today. But one of the things I want to say, uh, we've, we've really grown fond of Andy and Sharon and the staff around here. Uh, you probably know this, but uh, you've you got a wonderful church here. And your church is known throughout the vineyard. You, you, you really are. And uh, it, this is, it, so it's special for me to actually to be here and the last couple of days to be with the pastors and the staff. And I tell you what, I, I love the servant's heart. I, I love a commitment to being uh, multi-generational, old and young together. Uh, and how diverse this church is. It's just, you just have so many good things going. And sometimes you need somebody from the outside to remind you of what you got. Because you can just take it for granted because you're just here. Maybe you're here for the, for the first time. And if you are, I just want to say uh, already, you're in a very special place. And uh, so we just love being here over these last few days. And um, I have some things I'd like to share with you here today. So, so Becky and I have this ongoing thing. And I don't know if it's a guy thing. But sometimes, you know, I'll be driving around and, and, and Beck, you know, will say, you know, why don't you read the signs? And one of the reasons I don't read the signs is because sometimes, ever notice, sometimes signs don't make sense or they're confusing and, and then you kind of give up on the signs or it's like, so uh, I've, I've came across a, a number of signs that um, kind of make me not want to pay attention to signs or get a little confused. So I want to show them to you on the screen and, and see what you, what you think. So beware, wild animals and children. There you go. I don't not. I never knew those went together. Here's one. Not a not a through street evacuation route. Now that's helpful, right? That's really helpful. All right. Fishing for children only. Limit three. <laughs> My kids aren't going to that place. I tell you what. Here's one. Safe Haven Small Animal Hospital. Hunters welcome. I'm 
You got that one, didn't you? All right, here's another one. This light never turns green. Finally, somebody put up a sign that mattered. <laughs> How many have ever said that? Does this light ever turn green? <laughs> How many have ever run a red light when that happens? Just like it's just red, 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 and you just think, it's got to be okay. It's been 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, here, here's one. Now is a good time to visit our pastors on vacation. <laughs> Somebody needs to read these signs before they put them in front of a church. Now there's a helpful sign. I wouldn't have known. Really? Sand. Oh, I, you know, thanks for the warning. <laughs> here's one. Pet area. No pets allowed. <laughs> that messes with your head. Now, this is an important sign. Slow church services. More churches should put this sign in front of their building to warn people what they're getting into. The <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> Here you go. Our church. We love hurting people. I want to go there. Let me in. When does it start? <laughs> so, so Becky, I, you know, the sign, they weird, they're weird, man. I don't know what to do with them. So I, I want to talk to you some very personal things. It's kind of who I am, trying to be um, very, very real and open. I, I've, I'm nobody from nowhere, and God has changed my life. He's done something for me that I never thought possible, and I believe in miracles. And I believe in the miracle of God changing people's lives. And he started with me. And I hope that you might find encouragement today uh, from what I have to share. So, Jesus, you're, you're the one who changes people's lives. And, and you've changed people's lives in, in this room. And I, and I just suspect there's other people today that you want to change their life still. And you want to remind us that what you began in us, you want to finish it. So, God, I would just like to be a, a, a vessel of honoring you and bringing hope and encouragement to uh, our vineyard friends here. And so I pray, uh, I pray, Papa God, that uh, the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth today in this place would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about, do you see me? Do you see me? Seeing people through God's eyes. You know, one thing you notice if you're around kids, they love to be seen, don't they? If a child is playing on the playground or doing something new or experiencing something, you notice they're always looking over their shoulder, particularly for mom and dad or somebody, to, to see what they're doing. And it's, it's a natural thing that we, we want to be seen. I'm not sure that we outgrow that. But sometimes when you grow up feeling overlooked or discarded or nobody's, you know, put a hand on your shoulder and say, I believe in you, you're worth something, then you long for that and you look for that and sometimes you live your life, you know, for that affirmation from somebody. Does anybody even know I, I exist in, in this world? Becky and I have been going to the country of Jordan in the Middle East for the last 20 years and it's been very exciting to us. Uh, I train Arab pastors. Uh, indigenous Arab pastors who love the Lord in the Middle East. And I've had the privilege of serving them and training them over the last number of years. And so uh, we typically, we're going in a couple of weeks to Amman, Jordan. We had now have a, a church, a vineyard church that we call Oasis that's in Amman, Jordan. And there's a couple from our church that leads that. And it's very exciting. So typically when we go to Amman, we go to downtown, which is called the Souk. And... Um, and the souk is like a, a very crowded, you know, uh, marketplace downtown. And one time Becky went into a, a little shop and, uh, and she noticed that there was a little girl and her mom was with her and the, the mom was completely covered. All you could see is her eyes. And, she, and there was a, the little girl looked over and she smiled at that little girl. And I think the little girl smiled back. And then the next thing that Becky knew, this little girl started ramming into her. And... Uh, and the, the mother was just so embarrassed that she ended up grabbing that child and she ran out of the, out of the store. And Becky asked the question, wh wh why does she do that? The, and, and Becky is a champion of champion for kids. And she thought, you know, I, I don't, doesn't she know I love kids? Why did, she, why did she run into me like that? Why was she, why was she mean to me? 
And she felt like the Lord spoke to her after, in, in that moment that, Becky, you saw her. And she wanted you to see her again. And there was a moment that when she looked at that little girl, that little girl was clued into that. And you know, sometimes we will do even not good things for somebody to notice that we have an existence, that we're here. You know, it's that, you know, that little joke sometimes that people are saying something, it's, I'm right here. And it's kind of awkward when you have to tell somebody, I'm here. But don't you see me? And sometimes we don't. We pass people all the time. You pass people all the time. And we're, we're going by. And we, we see faces and we hear sounds. But I wonder if we really see people. Even people in, that we're in relationship with. Do we really know them? Do we look at them? Do we, do we see? And so this little girl in, in Jordan, I think, was a, a picture. Now, I, I believe that there's a generation at risk that's crying this out. Do you see me? A cry of young and old alike. Find me. Help me. Believe in me. S will somebody tell me I matter? Just tell me I belong. That was my story because somebody saw me and it changed the trajectory of my life, but it didn't start that way. You see, I was born in adultery. My mother, my 19-year-old mother, had an affair with a married man who had three children, blew up his world and blew up everybody's world around him, but she, she was courageous enough not to have an abortion or I wouldn't be talking to you today. And so she allowed me to be born, but it was pretty messed up. She finally broke off the, broke off the relationship after I, I was born, so I ended up with my father's name. And so I grew up with this single mom. But she was pretty broken herself. I, I, I don't even remember, have any memories of her, but I just know faces of going from one babysitter to the next and a grandmother and then this person and that person. And, and then by the time I was seven, my mom had had a, another child out of wedlock, my sister, and so now there's two of us. And then she gets married to a, a man that was a professional gambler and, and mean, and, and, they ha and they had physical fights, and we had police visiting us very regularly. I lived in, uh, in Los Angeles, and that was kind of a, I didn't know what a real family was. I hated my stepdad. I tried to defend my mother, and he would just throw me around, and, and I said, one day I'm going to kill him, and it was just, it was just, that was life for me. And then uh, that didn't last very long, and uh, so then he took off, and so that was my mom and us uh, four kids, and none of us really were related to the other, except we were all half, half brothers and sisters. I ended up not going to school, pretty much just living in the neighborhood. My mom was an alcoholic. It was almost easier when she wasn't around because I was very involved in sports, and that's one thing my mom did really well to get me involved in sports, and that kept me out of a lot of trouble. But it was really scary getting to my practices because she was drunk most of the time. And I really thought we weren't going to make it. And I was left alone at a very, you know, in a very scary neighborhood. I, I literally barricaded the door and put sounds you know, in the house so somebody wouldn't break in and do something to us. And so that was my life. And, and I, I didn't know, you know what was good or bad. It was just it was our survival mode. And then something happened. When I was uh, around 13 years old, uh, a neighbor, a friend of my, uh, my best friend's family, Apparently, they saw something going on, and they invited me to, to come and live with them. And that was bittersweet, my friends, because by, I ended up saying yes to that, and my mom said yes to that, but it blew up the family because my mom, at 13, my, I was the head of the family. My mom was gone for days, and I would be in charge. And, um, and so to, to say yes to this meant I would blow up the family. So my sister went one place, and she got in the system, and then my brothers went another place, and we kind of lost track for a while. And I went to live with this family. And it was crazy from no school that you had to go to school every day. Can you believe that? <laughs> every day. And, and, if you were, and if you were sick and stayed home from school, you had to really be sick. And you had to stay in bed. Man, that was a bummer. I, I was used to say, hey, I'm not feeling well. Oh, that's okay. I didn't do my homework. Oh, that's okay. And then I tried that with the Millers. And it's just like, okay, you don't have to go to school, but you're staying in bed, and you're going to the doctor, and you're not going to football practice. And you're not doing anything. Well, maybe I want to go to school. <laughs> and so there was a time to eat and dinner and all that. And all of a sudden, discipline. And then I ended up living with three other families to miraculously finish high school. 
miraculously go to college, get a master's degree, and now I've been able to share my story, some of what I'm sharing with you today, all over the world. When as a kid, I never got out of Los Angeles proper, and God has given me a life I could have never found for myself. And I've discovered that God doesn't have bastard children, which is what they called me. See, my day, you know, now there's just, I, I just, I'd just be one of the crowd. You know, there's lots of me going around now. But I tell you, my day wasn't like that. I stood out, you know, well, who's your daddy? I don't know him who's my daddy and that kind of stuff. So it was a, it was a deal. But it started because somebody saw me and didn't reduce me to a label and didn't dismiss me. And somehow I came to believe for the first time that maybe I matter. Not to God. There was no God or church. But I started to believe that maybe I'm worth something because somebody wanted me. And it was always challenging because in those families, as you, some of you might relate to, and I was grateful to be in the Millers and with my friend Jeff. I named my son after him. But I was never the son. I was kind of the addition, the, 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 the outreach you know, and, and I felt cared for, but it was always in each family, I was grateful, but never in. And that never changed until I met Jesus Christ. And I realized that we all get in through his adoption by the blood of Jesus. That there's no natural children that were born again, you know, and, and, and adopted in by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're all equal in that way. But that was a brand new thing to realize that that God might have a purpose for my life. How can God have a purpose for your life when you're born in adultery? Come on. And then he did. Because the Bible says before, the foundation of the world, he knew me and saw me and set forth his purposes in my life. I just didn't know it for a long time. And that's another story. So there's a guy in the Bible that I want to use today to illustrate uh, the, the story. Are you with me so far? Am I relating to you? You know, my, my church is used to what you see is what you get. And so today, what you see is, is what you get, you know, good or bad, up or down. This is it. So I want to talk about a guy named Mephibosheth. Now, that's kind of a mouthful. It took me a whole week to learn to pronounce that before I could teach this passage to our church. It, it was quite hilarious when I got started. Mephibosheth. And this is somebody that uh, is kind of obscure in the Bible, but it's someone that was overlooked, unseen, and set aside. Now, I want you to hear this from two vantage points. First of all, I may be talking about you. But secondly, I may be talking about somebody around you that you need to see. So uh, there's two levels of this, you and somebody around you. And so, you know, by the way, Mephibosheth, well, you know, some of you, I don't know what's going on with parents today. They always want to name their child a name that nobody else has or that everybody has. It's one or the other. So if you're looking for a name that nobody has, name your next son Mephibosheth. And I guarantee you they'll go to school and nobody will have their name. And I also guess that they will hate you forever, you know, <laughs> after middle school. You know, par parents, young parents, young parents. You know, I know you're looking for cool names, but you got, when you name your kid, think of middle school. <laughs> okay, it's cute to you, but it's not cute when you're in middle school. <laughs> I used to be a high school teacher, by the way, and a middle school teacher. And before, when I started, I was a substitute. And so, you know, a substitute, in, in, at least in the early days, I changed that real quick. You, you would do the roll call. And, you, and boy, you say somebody's name wrong, and the whole class erupts, and it sticks forever with that person. You just say, yeah, I never thought of that. That's who you are from now on. <laughs> I have to tell you, you're relating. Some pain, huh? Some pain. We can just stop right now. Jesus, bring your healing. <laughs> so here we go. In 2 Samuel, we're going we're gonna to launch there in, uh, in chapter 4. David and Jonathan were great friends. We probably know the story. Maybe you don't. But uh, Jonathan was the son of King Saul. And, and David was on the run from Jonathan's father who wanted to kill him because he was afraid that David wanted his throne. And they made a pact. And the pact was Jonathan's going to protect and take care of David, protect him from his father, from killing him. And David's pact back to Jonathan that if something happened to Jonathan in battle, that he would take care of his, of his son. And they had made that pact together, an agreement. Well, it happened in verse uh, 4 of chapter 4, 2 Samuel. Sa Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth 
who was crippled in both feet. Now you're going to notice something here. Every time that Mephibosheth's name is mentioned, it's always connected to his disability, his affirmity, until, until David. So let's go on anyway. He was five years old when the news came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan were dead. Mephibosheth's nurse had picked him up and run away, but as she turned to leave, she dropped him, and now he was lame, it says. So what happened, when you were a child of the king, if the king was killed in battle, then the next king would kill all of the children of the past king, or they went into exile. Now, I know it's crazy, but in that culture, that's how it went down. So the nur nurse would have grabbed Mephibosheth and said, we got to get out of here because you're going to die. And so nurse grabbed him and then dropped him, and then he became lame, and he, and he couldn't, in both feet, and he couldn't walk, and that was his condition. Now dial ahead, at one point, David had been king for a while, and then he, re he re remembers something. Wait a minute. I made a promise to Jonathan. I told him I would take care of his family. And so he, uh, he calls Ziba, which was Saul's uh, assistant and servant. And David asks, is anyone still left in Saul's family? I want to show kindness to that person for Jonathan's sake. Well, Ziba answered the king. Well, Jonathan, now listen to this. Jonathan has a son still living who is crippled in both feet. Now, when I, when I read that, why, why did you have to add that? Why couldn't you just say he's got a son and his name is Mephibosheth? But Ziba had to, had to warn David because he knew what, that, where it was going. He said, David, before you go get this boy, you got to know something about him. He's not quite right. He's got something wrong. He can't walk. He's lame in both feet. Ziba had to let him know what he was getting into. And then for the first time in Scripture, as Mephibosheth is mentioned, the king turns and asks him, well, where is he? Where is this son? Not who was lame, who has this disability, adding a label, but where is this son? Where is this boy? And for the first time, Mephibosheth's name is mentioned apart from his disability. I wonder how many of you know what it's like to carry that label or stigma. Bastard was mine and a few others. Maybe it's divorced, maybe it's druggy, alcoholic, or, or whatever it is. And, you know, I feel so strongly about this, and I love AA, but we don't allow labels. That, you know, we don't identify with our sin. We don't identify with our past. We don't identify what people have known us to be, have said we are, our mistakes, or any of those things. We're identified by name and that we are a child of God. And so we fight that because people identify by their sexual preference and all the rest. It's amazing to me, you know, how much they make. They're rich. They're poor. It's a, you know, a label, you know. And um, I don't, how many of you hate labels? Anybody? I hate them. Because they're not helpful. Because all they do is become a, a noose around your neck. Almost like a curse to live up to or down from. And even a good label can be really hard because you can't live up to it. When you've been told you're smart and you're bright and you're going to be successful. And then, you, and then it's not that. And that's your label. And uh, I think it can dehumanize people. Especially those with disabilities and struggles. Do you remember yours? I, I bet you could draw it up in a moment, even if you're 50, 60, 70 years old. How many can remember a label of some kind that's put on you or you've embraced along the way? Raise them up. How many? You got one? How can you remember those things? Don't they? Just words, right? They stick. The good words seem to come and go, but the the other one stick, especially when you already believe it. Kids making fun of your name is one thing, but then the, when there's things that happen and, and this is who you are. You know, one of the things I, I love from having parents uh, in our church with children with special needs, they've taught me um, that um, God is a people first God. And it's really important if you have a, a, a child with special needs. I've had to really work at this one. It's not just political correctness that it's the person first. 
It's a child, you know, with a special need and, or adult with a special need. It's a person first. And you, if you're around an, a, a parent with a child, that's really big to them. And I've had to learn that language. And you know what? They are right. It is important. And we can learn from them because God is a people first. God, when he thinks of you, speaks of you, it's you first, not your disability attached. And it certainly isn't in front of that. And so I think, I think it's, a big, it's a big deal. So let's go on in our story. Then King David... King David had servants bring Jonathan's son from the house of Machar, son of Emil, and load the bar. Now listen to this. So Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, came before David, and he bowed face down on the floor. He dropped to the floor. See, Mephibosheth would have known. He might have been, you know, um, 10, 12, 15. I, we don't know exactly how old he was, but it, he had been older at this point. And so when he gets before the king, even though he can't walk, he just bows down. Now, you know, in terms of culture, he would assume that his life is over at that point. He's brought before the king to die. And David said, Mephibosheth, again, addresses him by name, without any attachments, no labels. And Mephibosheth says, I am your servant. And David said to him, don't be afraid, because he was and should have been in the natural. I will be kind to you for your father Jonathan's sake. I will give back all the land of your grandfather Saul who is a very evil guy, and you will always eat at my table. To eat at his table, this is always emotional to me. It's like you will be part of this part of this family, not an appendage. To eat at the king's table was the greatest privilege. So David doesn't just welcome Mephibosheth and say, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you that. That was nice. And this is a picture of God in the relationship we have with him. It says, Mephibosheth, you will eat at my table. But Mephibosheth's self-image, like some of us, you know, we self-reject ourselves. We reject ourselves so nobody else will. You ever been, are you one of those? I used to do that. It's easy if I reject me so you don't have to. Because if you reject me, I got nothing left. So Mephibosheth bowed down to David again. He said, you're being very kind to me, your servant. And I am no better than a dead dog. Where's that coming from? It's coming how he feels about himself. He said, I don't belong here. I don't believe he heard David. The king, you will eat at my table. So, oh, 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 uh -uh. You don't know what you're looking at. There's no way you want me at your table. But David was looking at Mephibosheth. And as is, he says, you're going to eat at my, my table. Then King David called Saul's servant Ziba back. And David said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants will farm the land and harvest the crops. Then your family will have food to eat. So now he's calling Ziba. He says, I'm going to take care of you too, buddy. Notice what he, how he finishes. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will always eat at my table. He brought it back again. You know, maybe he knew that Mephibosheth didn't hear him. I think that's such a similar piece that God wants to speak his affirmation of you, his choosing of you. God doesn't have illegitimate sons and daughters that were all chosen and pursued by God because he really wants you at his table. He really wants you in his family, so much so that he sent his one and only son to die for you, to get you there. And sometimes we only focus on the sin, but Jesus died for a relationship that you would have a seat at his table. And it's not just be, you know, if you behave or if you measure up. I mean, you know, what, what, what's cool about this is David is not embarrassed to have Mephibosheth sitting at that table with the rest of his sons and daughters. And sometimes we, we feel like God's embarrassed with us or with, with some people. Yeah, this is, uh, it, it, Mephibosheth's life was about to be changed. Mephibosheth, you don't get it, buddy. It's not for a meal tonight. It's for the rest of your life. 
you have a seat and you will eat at my table. There's a generation, by the way, all around us, generation young and old. When I think of generation, I think of this generation. And I'm an old guy now, but I'm a this generation person. That's how I look at it. I, I'm not living in my generation when I was younger. I'm living in this generation. And that makes me part of this generation. So you can be part of this generation and be six, or you can be part of this generation and 66. That's just my opinion. And so it's a matter of whether you're living today or you're living yesterday or you're living tomorrow. But if we're living today, then we're all part of this generation. But anyway, there's part of this generation who can't get to the table on their own. They got to be brought. So Mephibosheth had a seat at the table. But he couldn't get to the table. He couldn't get to the table. He couldn't get to David. So David had to send some people to bring Mephibosheth to the table. There was a place at the table for Mephibosheth. Are you, are you tracking with me? Some of you, you wouldn't be here today if somebody didn't bring you because you couldn't get there. You're so broken, you're upside down, so addicted or whatever it might be that you, you couldn't get out from where you are, but somebody probably extended a hand to you at some point. Now it's up to you whether you take that hand and maybe you're here this morning and you're, maybe it's your first time in the room. You know, and, uh, and God's hand has been extended to you in a lot of different ways. So it's, you don't have to take it, but it's there anyway. But the, but the lightning rod in this passage to me is the, the realization that if David didn't go get Mephibosheth, it was just a nice idea that he heard and he saw, but it's like, wait, well, if, if Mephibosheth can get here, good on him. Seat at my table. Go tell him he can come. But David, he can't come. He can't get here on his own. Somebody's got to go get him. I believe that's the picture of the church, that there's people all around us. Now, now maybe some can just, they can come, even thinking of church. Some people can get here, they can figure it out, and they've maybe grown up, but there's a lot of people like me. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't figure it out. It was weird to me. I didn't know the sorrow. I didn't know the jargon. It was just weird. You know, the whole thing was weird to me, and nobody helped me figure it out for a long time. And I think there's a generation all around us that, that we don't see because we just see Christians. We just see each other. We just see what we have. We don't, we're, not, we're not looking maybe out, outside of that. So there was an, uh, I'll close with this, that uh, there was a, a, a time when Jesus was uh, walking with his disciples and there was a guy crying out on the roadside. And Jesus stopped. Now this guy was blind. And he was crying out. And, um, and Jesus stopped and he asked a really interesting question in Luke 18, 41. So what do you want me to do for you? That's what he said. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to see. I mean, that's like obvious. It's like you, you, Jesus knew that, but he, he, I almost wanted to hear it. You know, there's, there's a two-faceted you know, thing here. Sometimes we say we want help, but we really aren't willing to get help. And so he, 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 he probed. He said, what do you want? And the and man said, I, I, I really want to see. And, I, and sometimes, you know, when I think about even that situation, uh, it's like, do you, uh, okay, you want to see, but are you willing to take the responsibilities of what happens when you see? Because if you see, then you're not a beggar anymore. That means you have to work anymore. Now you're going to be part of the society. Now you're going to be helping other people. You're going to be on the other side of this. So you really want to see. Do you really want to get well? I know people all the time, you really, you know, Jesus asked the guy that was 38 years, you know, um, as an invalid, you know, do you really want to get well? Because if you do, you're not going to live here anymore. You're going to get up and you're going to go and you're going to live life. Some people say, I want to get well, but they don't want to, all that goes with being well. But not everybody wants to see. What I love about your church, I think you do. I don't think you want to be blind to people around you. I think you want to see. And I think God wants to give you his eyes. To see people through his eyes without the labels. And sometimes when you see people around us, we actually see them through our labels. 
which makes, us, makes it difficult to see people as they really are. I say let's blow up the labels. Let's blow them up. And let's live as free men and women, as sons and daughters, and with our heads up and our eyes open and not being afraid of what we see. Lastly, I'll tell you a story that's helped us see. There was a gal in our church. She was uh, very severely disabled. She was in a wheelchair. She couldn't talk. Um, she, couldn't, she couldn't walk. The only faculty she had, she could hear. And she sat in the back. We had an outreach for children that, with disabilities, and she had a buddy, as we call him, and she was in the back. And Becky walked by one day, and she saw um, Emma. And as she walked by, she saw Emma. Now, Emma was there all the time, but this day she saw Emma. You know what I'm talking about? She saw Emma, and she said, God, does Emma get anything out of anything? Out of this? Out of life? Do you, do you, do you, do you know her? Do you, does she, is there anything happening here? She kind of left it at that about a month or two later. I got a, a very interesting invitation to go to Warsaw, Poland, to do a Catholic charismatic uh, um, youth leadership conference that I was leading. And we, we spent a number of days. At the end of the conference, uh, a young guy came up with an older man to Becky and said, this man feels like he has a word for you, but he doesn't speak any English whatsoever. And so Becky says, well, sure. And so the, the man came up to her, and, and then he shared these, these four words. Emma is singing hallelujah. She said, What? Emma is singing hallelujah. And Becky burst into tears and she couldn't stop crying for like an hour because she knew that God was speaking about our Emma. And all of a sudden, God was saying, I know Emma. And I see Emma. And Emma has a relationship with me. You don't see her like I do. And God opened Becky's eyes to this man in Poland, halfway across around the world to give us a word from somebody that doesn't speak English that made no sense to him but made every sense. And that's been a war cry for us in our church. To see people through God's eyes, not our own. And there's so much more going on in you and people around you and me if we'd only see them through his eyes. Can I pray for you? Father God, is, Lord, I, I pray that you give us your eyes, but Lord, your eyes to see us, ourselves through your eyes. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would break the power of labels to rule over our lives from this day forward. No more. No more. Lord, I ask that you just bust them up right now. And Lord, I ask that you would bring your healing. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a label that you've become aware of as I've been talking that just needs to go? Could I just see your hand? Would you leave them up? You got a label that needs, needs to go. Even a good one that you're tired of living up to. Leave your hand up a minute. Jesus, I ask you to take those labels and you just restore your label that we are your beloved son and daughter. Nothing more, nothing less than that, God. Lord, I pray for freedom and liberty and hope and deliverance in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Well, Lord, I just continue to pray, and uh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for um, uh, I, when when Rick was speaking, I felt like when he said that that phrase that that um, maybe you feel embarrassed about being at God's table. I felt like that God was speaking to some of you. That that's how you feel. You've made a decision of faith, yet you keep 
allowing yourself to just think, I really don't belong here. I don't really, God can't really use me. I'm that, that person with that, you know, that I embarrass God. And, and God, I believe God's word for you is that he sees you. You're invited. You're, you have equal sonship, equal daughtership around his table. And that you need to receive that. You need to say, God, I'm done feeling like a second-class citizen in your kingdom. I'm done feeling embarrassed about who I am. Thank you, Lord, for that you love me just the way I am. Would you do that? Just say, God, today, I'm just going to receive your love. I'm going to receive the authority and, the, and, the, and the, the privileges that come with being a Christ follower. Just say that to the Lord. Today, Lord, I accept no more embarrassment. And then also I believe God's speaking to some of you about inviting people to the table. Some of you have been dining with the king for years. And it's been a while since you've invited someone to the table. God says this table is open. But some people cannot get there. And he wants you to bring them. He wants you to bring them. If that's not been on your radar, then it begins with just saying, God, who would it be? Now, you might know. Right when I said that, you might think, yeah, I know who I could bring. But maybe that's not even been on your radar, and you just need to pray and say, God, who? Just open your heart up and say, God, who would it be? And don't say their no for them. They might say no, but you don't say no for them. You just say, God, I'll be available. I'll be that person to invite them to the table. Now this, uh, starting next week, we have a great Christmas series. People are thinking about things associated with Christianity around Christmas. That's why we're doing the Christmas at the movies, and it makes it real easy. Some of you, this week, you need to shoot them a digital file. We have that uploaded on our social media, on our website, you know, of the invitation, or hand it to them, or mail it to them. Say, I'd love to have you there. I'll come by and pick you up. I'll do, help them to get to the table. Lord, I thank you for this church, that we're an inviting church, that we, we belong at the table, but we also are not okay with it just being us and no more. We want other people to come, and we're going to help, help bring them there. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.